So the objectives of, of my talk is to understand the current is state of knowledge of the association of CLL risk with epidemiological factors, genetic factors, and monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis. And the other component is to understand the clinical implications of these factors. So let's start with the basic epidemiology of CLL. Um, from the SEER Cancer Registry, we can see that most of the, the incidence of CLL has been fairly stable from 1992 to 2008, where you see about five newly incident uh, CLL cases per year per 100,000 individuals. And then only in, 19, in 2008 do you start seeing a change uh, of the incidence, and that has to do with the change of the criteria for, for CLL, which, uh, which incorporated including the absolute B-cell count and so the absolute lymphocyte count. And so my colleague Tim Call kind of com compared the incidence rate looking at the 1996 criteria, which had the absolute lymphocyte count, and the 2008 criteria, which has the absolute B cell count. And you can see the, the incident drops by about a third. So people who were previously called CLL are now called monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, or MBL. And you can see the incidence for MBL increases um, when you change the diagnosis criteria. So what are other known risk factors associated for CLL? If we continue with our basic bi epidemiology, age is certainly a risk factor. So people virtually under the age of 30 do not have, uh, have, have, do not have CLL, and you can see that CLL incidence increases with age, where the median age of onset is 71 years of age. Uh, sex is another risk factor for CLL. It's consistently shown um, that males have a higher incidence of CLL compared to females. And ethnicity, so based on the SEER registry again, uh, the CLL incidence is higher in Caucasians than what you find in um, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. So what about these non-demographic factors? So age, sex, race, you can't change them, can't do anything about it. Um, so there's been a number of studies that have been conducted. The largest to date is through the Interlymph Consortium, where we have pooled uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma case control studies, including CLL, uh, uh, into these studies, and here the stars indicate where all the studies have been conducted, including in our colleagues in Australia. And so what we did is we looked at a whole bunch of, of environmental risk factors uh, that were self-reported by these, these patients and for the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma subtypes, including CLL. So for CLL, we had uh, 2,440 CLL cases and over 15,000 controls that were in this study who answered these questions about their lifestyle, alcohol, smoking, BMI, reproductive history, for example, on parity, hormone therapy. We had um, information about your medical history, so your autoimmune conditions, prior history of autoimmune conditions, uh, hepatitis C viral infections, atopy, allergies, asthma, uh, blood transfusion, height, we had occupational questions in there, um, including farming exposures, and then we had family history of, of hematological malignancies. And so what we found is that sun was protective, UV radiation, either it's recreational or total sun exposure, was protective against getting CLL risk. Uh, for, we did not find any reproductive factors. Uh, for medical factors, uh, what we observed was uh, hepatitis C viral infections was, had increased risk of getting CLL. Atopy, allergies, uh, hay fever, for example, uh, reduced your risk of getting CLL. And height increased your risk. And then uh, farming exposures uh, increased your risk as well as family history. So what are some underlying mechanisms for these, for these factors? So sun, it's, we hypothesize this is the vitamin D pathway. Uh, vitamin D has anti-proliferative and pro-differentiating effects. For atopy, the hypothesis is you have a hyper, um, immune, hyperactive immune system. For height, there's two kind of theories behind this. Um, it, uh, you have increased exposure of growth hormones that stimulate B cell proliferation. Or alternatively, you had, as you were growing up, increased infections, which are associated with shorter height. And then increased infections means you have a more stronger developed immune system. Farming, this is a consistent risk factor that's been shown in many studies, but still it's unknown what aspect of farming uh, is driving this association. Is it working with animals? Is it working with pesticides? When you do these studies, it's very difficult because you start getting smaller and smaller in numbers, and now you don't know if the finding is real or false positive. A couple things to note, sun and, height, or sun and farming are the only two uh, risk factors that you can actually modify but so far, none of the factors are, are, are factors that you can change your lifestyle or, or, or change something that you do. 
The other thing to note about these factors is that they're essentially all been done in Caucasian studies. So how they translate into other eth ethnic and, and racial groups is still unknown. So family history is a risk factor that has been consistently shown uh, and as well established risk factor for risk of CLL. One of the larger studies that have been conducted was with my colleague Lynn Golden in, in 2004 where they used the Swedish population registry. So they have a, a family registry and they have uh, the cancer registry and they merged those two registries together. And what they found is that first degree relatives of CLL patients have an eight and a half fold increased risk. This is one of the uh, strongest risk factors among many cancers, actually. And so they also found that these first-degree relatives also have an ele elevated risk of other non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so a two-fold increased risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, there was a twin study that also showed uh, increased risk. So they had 20,000 twins, and they uh, lumped leukemia, uh, acute and uh, chronic leukemias together, but they continued to show the familial risk. And the fact that the familial risk is mostly due to inherited variants and not um, uh, shared environment. So what about these inherited genetic variants? So uh, genome-wide association studies have been a very successful tool to identify genomic regions in the genome uh, to uh, associate with the disease. And what it does is it's an agnostic approach um, that you have genotyped these positions across the genome. And you might have 500,000 to over a million markers that you genotyped. And for each position, you're looking for association with your disease. And so you typically have unrelated cases and controls. And having this study of over a million markers that you're testing, you have to have a strong study design in order to uh, reduce out false positive and make sure you have a real result. And so they require a very stringent level of significance, and they also require uh, independent validation. So these studies have, have consistently identified strong findings. And so for CLL, there have been a number of been identified GWAS studies that have been done to date. And the largest one is with my colleague, Philip Law, where we combined 4,486 CLL cases and just over 13,000 controls. And so in this paper, we identified the, the little blue, um, the regions that are in blue, um, but we also validated the other regions that are in red. And so over 40 variants have been identified to date total across all these, these GWAS studies. A couple things to note about this figure is that it's across the whole genome, and we just list the genes here, but the variants that we identified are not necessarily in the genes. They're, they're, they're the nearest gene to the variants identified, and these, most of the variants are actually in non-coding regions, and it's an active area of research right now to understand what these genes are doing or what these variants are doing. Um, but we did uh, correlate um, these, these variants and, and identified there's a strong relationship among a, a number of them, and actually they fall into apoptotic pathways and telomere length uh, maintenance pathways and B-cell lymphocyte, lymphocyte development. So these are biologically plausible pathways for increasing your risk of getting CLL. So one of the other things we've done with these, poly, with, with these uh, inherited genetic variants is created a polygenic risk score. And what that is is that each position you have zero, one, or two copies of the high-risk variant. And so my, what my postdoc did, uh, Geffen Kleinstorn, is she took the average number of polygenic risk variants across the, the 41 loci. And you can see that the distribution uh, for this average is, is significantly higher in the CLL cases than what you find in the controls. And we validated this again in an independent sample of CLL cases and controls. The black line is the, is, is the distribution of this average number of risk variants is in the controls is the black line. And then in the CLL cases, it's the red line here. And you can see that's a strong effect, highly significant, that, that having this um, distribution of polygenic risk scores uh, uh, can help you separate whether or not you have CLL or controls. The other thing we did is we looked in our CLL families. These are families with two members with CLL in them. And we took the unaffected first degree relative and we looked at this distribution of the average number of polygenic, or average number of inherited variants. And you can see that the, in the unaffected individuals, the distribution is, is even higher, significantly higher than what you find in the controls, which means that these first degree relatives who don't yet have CLL or may never get CLL have a higher number of inherited genetic variants that increases your risk of getting CLL. The other thing we did is we looked at our family members who had that, that we screened for monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, or MBL, the precursor to CLL, and they have an even larger number of inherited variants uh, than what you see in the controls. In fact, their distribution pretty much overlaps what you see for CLL, suggesting that the inherited variants for CLL are also, uh, are also increase your risk of getting monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. <clears throat> 
So what about other ethnicities? Uh, what, what are the genetic studies that have been done? Very few, and they're very small. And if you remember, the incidence of CLL in other ethnicities is, is significantly lower than what we see in the Caucasians. So two studies have been done, one in the Chinese with 71 CLL cases compared to the over 4,000 in our Caucasian. Uh, and they, they took six of the, of the SNPs um, that have been identified in the Caucasian studies and looked at them in the Chinese. And three of those six were significant. Likewise, African American studies, we had looked at 110 CLL cases and used public controls for this study. And we looked at 15 of the inherited variants identified in Caucasians in these African Americans and none of them were associated with the risk of CLL. Well, what does that mean? Um, well, just taking a look, all the GWAS studies in CLL have been done in Caucasians, and what genome-wide association studies do is they look for common variants, not rare variants, common variants associated with the disease. And here's an example of four of the variants, and they all have frequencies greater than 20%. But if you take these same variants and you look at a population of controls in Chinese, three out of the four have frequencies of less than 1%. And likewise, for African American, the frequencies of these variants are 10% or less. So they're not so common in these other ethnicities. So what needs to happen is that we do a, 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 another GWAS in these particular populations, looking for common variants that increase your risk of CLL in those groups. But the, trying to find all, uh, a large number of these CLL cases in other ethnic groups is, is challenging. So what about monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, or MBL? So MBL is an asymptomatic condition. Uh, it's a clonal population of B-cells that have a similar immunophenotype to CLL, but it has an absolute B-cell count less than 5 times 10 to the 9 cells per liter, whereas if you're above this threshold, you have CLL. So the prevalence of MBL, it's quite common. It's 4 to 10 percent among those uh, in age 40 to 60 years of age. And the prevalence of MBL increases with age. And then uh, among those who are over 80 years of age, the prevalence is 18 percent. So it goes up. But let's look in our first-degree relatives. These are individuals who have a first-degree relative of CLL. So if you're a first-degree relative, you don't have CLL, but let's look at the prevalence of MBL. The prevalence is much higher. It's 15 to 18 percent in these first-degree relatives. Uh, and it, like, like in the general population, the prevalence increases with age. But those who are over the age of 80 years, the prevalence of MBL is 46 percent. So almost half of them in these families will uh, go on to having MBL. So why is MBL important here? Well, um, Ola Langren and colleagues have uh, identified that nearly all CLLs prior to their diagnosis had MBL. And up to six years prior, uh, you were able to observe the MBL before their CLL diagnosis. And because MBL is very common, uh, much more common than what you see on CLL, MBL is just not an earlier ascertainment of the CLL. So there's a lot of people who with MBL who won't go on to having CLL. So their MBL has various subtypes. Um, it can be either defined by its immunophenotype or it can be de defined by its clonal size. So um, high count MBL is defined as those with clonal counts of 0.5 times 10 to the 9 cells per liter. And then low count is below this threshold. So one of my colleagues, uh, Samir Parikh, had looked at, so if you're looking at the risk of MBL going on to CLL, uh, they had pulled in 445 high count MBLs. These are individuals who have lymphocytosis. They come to your clinic. Uh, and then they go get screened and get flow cytometry, and then voila, they have this clonal population of B cells. And what they found is that among these high count MBLs, the rate of progression from high count MBL to, to CLL is about 1.4% per year requiring therapy, and the five year incidence is at 7.7%. So let's switch gears to the low-count MBL. This, these are individuals that um, don't have lymphocytosis. You, you have to go collect a research blood, and you screen them for MBL. There are two studies conducted to date, an Italian cohort and a Salamanca cohort. In the Italian cohort, they had uh, 53 individuals. Uh, they first evaluated at, at, at the baseline. They had a clonal uh, counts of less than one cell per microliter. That's significantly less than the high count, which is over 500 cells per microliter. And then after 36 months of average follow-up, uh, the, the median clonal count went up to two cells per microliter. So these, these population-based uh, individuals with MBL are not progressing in their B-cell count, and none of them progress to high-count MBL, uh, let alone CLL. And the other cohorts, the Salamanca cohort, where they uh, had, again, at the first time point, the baseline cell count was less than one cell per microliter. 
And then after a median of seven years of follow-up, these individuals really still had low count MBL with only uh, just about two cells per mi microliter. Only one person actually progressed to high count MBL. They went above that threshold of 500 cells per microliter after seven years of follow-up. So really, the progression in, of, these, of these cell counts in the general population is, is quite modest. Now, what about our first degree relatives? So we screened in our families with two members of CLL um, or more. Uh, we screened 400 individuals uh, for MBL. And after f just 5.7 years of follow-up, 10 of these individuals progressed to CLL in that time frame. All 10 had MBL prior to their CLL diagnosis. One had it eight years prior to their CLL diagnosis, with four being low count MBLs at the time, at the initial time we screened them. So we estimated a progression rate uh, to CLL of about 0.4% uh, per year. So are these factors, age, sex, um, genetic factors, uh, environmental factors, ready for clinical practice? Um, in my opinion, I think it's still premature to be doing any genetic testing uh, or any screening for CLL. None of the inherited variants that we have identified to date are like high-risk predisposition genes, where you have BRCA1, for example, in breast cancer. If you have certain variants, you have a, a, a strong chance of getting uh, breast cancer. Our inherited variants for CLL are very low risk. Uh, even when you combine them together, um, and you haven't increased your risk, but it's still very modest compared to what you have for some of these variants for BRCA1. There's no preventive th therapy. So if you find that a person has MBL and they have a large number of inherited variants, there's nothing to do about it yet. So uh, there's no therapies that, or, or lifestyle changes a person can necessarily do. And there's quality of life issues. I mean, it, it really is person dependent if they want to know if they have MBL or if they want to know about their genetic testing but it could cause uh, anxiety and, and stress about knowing uh, these factors. At Mayo Clinic, the practice guidelines uh, for a person who has high count MBL, so they've been identified to have lymphocytosis, screened to have flow cytometry, identified to have high count MBL, the recommendations that we follow them annually. So in summary, both genetic and non-genetic factors are associated with CLL risk. The non-genetic factors are demographic, age, sex, ethnicity, Sun exposures and atopy decrease your risk, and farming and hepatitis C uh, viral and, and height increase your risk. And to date, there are 41 inherited genetic variants. We, we know that we'll find more with larger sample sizes. And ultimately, these inherited variants is going to replace the familial risk that we've identified. MBL is a precursor to CLL. It's a common condition. It's higher in families than you see in the general population. Uh, data shows that high count and familial MBLs progress to CLL. Little is known about how the associations, all these risk factors uh, play out in other ethnicities. And right now, no screening is recommended at this time. So thank you.